Welcome to Cerulean Arts Gallery uh, for the uh, current collective member exhibition, Virtual Tour and Talk. This exhibition features the work of Kathleen Cohen, Susan D'Alessio, Jeannie Perry, Mary Powers Holt, and Ian Wagner. The show is up through uh, June the 4th, so hope you can come down and see it. We are recording this uh, Zoom, so we'll edit and put it on our YouTube channel. You can watch it later or send it to your friends. Um, if you can't make the exhibition in person, you can see everything on our website. And I'll put a link in the chat to each artist page as we go. So uh, Kathy Cohen is first up, but she can't be with us tonight. Oh. So, but she made a video for us. So I'm gonna share my screen and we'll start with that. Okay, you guys see Kathy? Yep. Okay, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> Let me fix the video. Owen, um, I'm a watercolor painter and also a poet. And I feel like my poetry and my painting, paintings are always a conversation. I don't typically illustrate my poems. Usually the paintings come first and the poems later in relationship. So I, I've done some realistic-ish um, paintings. Um, I've done a series of still lives this year, but I also paint um, more abstractly. I feel like my objective work relates to my abstract work in many ways, and I, I hope you'll um, think so too. She said she was thinking about taking a class and I'm going to take I don't think that's an option. I can't hear you. Yeah, I can't hear anything.
All right, and that's uh, Kathy Cohen. So now I'm going to spotlight Tina's video, and we'll uh, next is Ginny Perry. Hi, Hi. Ginny. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Ginny Perry, and I'm an artist and high school art educator from um, rural Upper Bucks County. Uh, I attended Philadelphia College of Art uh, and was an illustration major. And uh, I also received my art education certification from Moore College of Art. And I studied drawing and painting at PAFA for um, many years. Um, I, I was a, I am a volunteer lay chaplain at a nursing home facility which led me to create the body of work that I am producing today. Um, my work, I use various mediums um, and uh, di different techniques, and I'm focusing on the nursing home culture and the inspiring people I have met through this experience. Um, I wrote a little something about it, uh, my experience. With each portrait, I'm attempting to remind the viewer that despite their limitations, the elderly still have plenty to say, and it is our privilege to listen. The images are often heart-wrenching, but I try to present them with empathy and compassion and to show the deep emotional connection I've made with each resonant. My collection of portraits aims to bring more awareness to our aging community members and um, uh, Alzheimer's patients as well, uh, specifically those living in nursing homes and serves a, as a reminder that their lives are rich with meaning and purpose. So, um, uh, many of these pieces that you're seeing um, are people that um, I know from um, this nursing home that I do my volunteer work from. And uh, I don't sit there and draw them. I usually um, go home and, I, uh, and, I, and I'll work on a sketch and I'm thinking of them as I'm doing the piece. There is, um, well, this, this one right here, I did do from a photograph. Um, but I, I, the patients don't, I change their faces. I have, um, you know, um, I change the, the feeling, the, um, the, uh, at the atmosphere. Um, and also there is um, one patient specifically, and I will, um, when we get to her, I'll, I'll explain. Uh, this person is someone who is in the dementia unit and her name is Kathy. Um, and uh, very anxious, um, very hard to communicate with her every once in a while. She'll, she'll say something to me, but everything is very scattered because she, um, she is so anxious. Ginny, could you talk a little bit about your technique? Oh, I have all different types of techniques. Oh, before I talk about that, this is um, Patrice. And she, um, she gives me permission to take pictures. And she is in sound mind. Um, she has been in the nursing home um, uh, situation for a while. She has no family. Uh, she has a daughter who doesn't visit her. And often she is telling me, you know, her story, some, some you know, when I'm writing it down. And um, she is hoping and hoping that her daughter will come through and she can move out of the nursing home. But she's been there for about five years and uh, we've become good friends. I, I, love, I love speaking to her. Try to, I go in to speak to her often. Every once in a while, I'll take her out too. But as far as techniques, um, I love working uh, in ink. I enjoy ink, I, but sometimes when I, when I work with ink, 
um, I dip a string in ink and then I draw with it. I like that because it loosens me up and I, and I don't get super tight. Um, these little paintings that I'm doing are very spontaneous. Some of it is, is poured paint and I scrape. Um, you know, sometimes I don't know what it's gonna look like. Sometimes I'll pour something and I'll play around with it and I'll say, oh yeah, okay. That sort of reminds me of Daniel. That reminds me of John. That reminds me of Patrice when she was stretching when she stood up. Um, this man, um, it, the painting is called Bob. That's not his real name, but uh, I wanted to protect his uh, anonymity. And he just recently passed, but what a, a, a lovely man. He has nine children and um, he, he um, it, they all come in to visit him. And, but, and, and what a wonderful man. And, and also um, he has a sound, he did have a, a sound mind, but he just recently passed away. So, you know, I capture, scenes that, I, you know, th uh, situations that I see in the nursing home. So, Ginny, um, being there, did that cause, like, you to shift your work from more landscape botanical oriented? Oh, goodness, yes. Um, yeah, and, and I still do botanicals. I mean, they're not your, uh, uh, like a traditional botanical, but, um, you know, I usually have poor paint in the background and I'll draw on top of it, um, you know, trying to capture, say, you know, something in the wind or um, something dying or, uh, and sometimes I'll do landscapes too. And um, there are a few landscapes in the show, so I can, I can show those as well. This is a piece done in gouache, poured paint, I draw on top of it. This is a woman who just you know, she always has her makeup on. And she always looks so beautiful, but she sits alone in her room. And that's Patrice on the left. I have a lot of pieces of Patrice. And this is a woman who, uh, she had uh, recently passed, um, but very um, serious dementia. And sometimes she will just, you know, sit there and, and, and I'll talk with her and she'll say, where am I? You know, oh, can I go home? Um, but, you know, she's, she's lovely, she's soft-spoken. And then I, I try to display all the activity. This is the common room where there's a lot of families visiting and, and she is um, just sitting there feeling kind of lost and not, and wondering about all this activity in the background. And here's one of my, you know, just a simple botanical of, um, of a flower pod. And this is um, a, a painting that I started a while back and then I went back into it. And it was right, and I was inspired 
by images that I saw on television of um, the, you know, the bombings in the Ukraine. So um, I called it hope for Ukraine because there, there is, um, when you go down a little lower, there's, there's um, light, you see light. And um, for me, that represents hope. And that's another one of Patrice that was uh, in the corner. Well, thanks so much, Ginny. You're welcome. It's a very powerful and moving exhibition. And now we come to Mary Powers Holt. Hello, Mary. Hi, everyone. Hi, and thank you um, for coming. And thanks for the exhibition, Mike and Tina. Um, so I just a little uh, about me. I've been a painter for almost 40 years. I started at the Academy, um, first the University of Arts, and then um, went to the Academy um, 40 years ago, <laughs> graduated, which is uh, something to, I, I can't believe it's been that long. Um, I live right outside or outside Philadelphia in Chester County um, on what was at one time a, a farm. Um, and there's a lot of very old buildings here. So some of the landscape, um, the sky around me and the, the buildings themselves often inspire my work. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a tradition, I'm definitely not a representational traditional landscape painter, but I do love also doing some um, plein air work. Um, the paintings on this wall, um, I was looking at the, I usually look at the light that's coming behind the paintings and I start priming my paintings with usually um, whatever color seems to be um, coloring that light that's behind it. So that was like a gold and an interference pearl. That's rough water um, painted at um, Marsh Creek State Park, um, which is also very close by and I use a lot in my paintings. Um, the two middle paintings are an acrylic on aluminum panels. The bottom one's a plein air painting from Marsh Creek and the top one's from Cape May Point. Uh, not a plein air painting. Uh, the clouds were moving too quickly, but I loved the blue, um, the dark blue, and I really wanted to capture that. So a lot of what I look at, um, I was a figurative painter when I started at the Academy, then I was very much into large abstractions. Um, what drew me to the landscape when we moved out here was really uh, the color fields, how I could blend so many colors and um, just, I, I was really loved that so much. Um, so this is uh, actually autumn, early autumn sky and summer weeds. Uh, I painted this downstairs from the windows of my studio first. I was, wanted to capture the sky or the base of the painting and then finished it in the studio. Um, there were, that evening, there were like uh, horizontal stripes of colors just moving. And I just wanted to try to capture that movement um, and then accentuated that in the landscape. So I was not trying to make it fully representational. I think that's what I see with the sky and the landscape a lot, that everything's constantly moving and changing. And I try to capture that from some time to time. And then I go into representation and the building is like kind of an abstract shape um, it's actually a shed that we have um, in, in, uh, in, on the, was part of the farm. Um, now just has a lot of uh, storage and <laughs> things in it. So, um, so I, I love, really liked how Mike and Tina laid out that wall with like the daytime paintings. And then we go into more um, nighttime paintings. And it, 
originally I thought of naming this show Wandering Around in the Dark during the Summer, but I thought that sounded a little odd. Um, this is Night Shirt, which I was, I had taken pictures of, um, the, that's a little birdhouse that, not a little, but it's a birdhouse that sits on a garden wall. And then my husband was hanging his shirt on the line and I liked kind of the juxtaposition of it when I was looking at the photograph that I took I was thinking of um, I think De Chirico's, um melancholy on the street not specifically that painting but um, just the porticos with the darkness in it um, I'd probably like to do this again um, but was thinking you know more or less in a surreal vein for that one um, the next two are uh, plein air paintings. That's um, our some morning garden, and uh, they're both acrylic on aluminum. And that's um, shimmer green, which is looking down um, towards a hill. Um, so I do like to do some quick studies outside sometimes and paint outside. I, I enjoy that from time to time, sometimes bigger works. I'd say, though, I'm primarily a studio painter um, looking for more abstract elements and compositions and uh, that in that vein. Um, this is that's this is the same garden that was the morning garden, although I um, infused it a little more. I added flowers. It's evening sunflowers and evening sunflowers when they're do they turn. So I was trying to make them turn uh, in the garden and just have the colors like flow through. Um, kind of disappearing into the blue. I primed this with like an indigo blue um, background. Um, you know, maybe in the back of my mind when I started the painting, I wasn't thinking of Ukraine when I started the painting, but at the same time I was painting it. Um, I think it was the anniversary of Ukraine. So I was thinking how um, there's so much hope uh, with the people of Ukraine in the darkness, if you want to to say that, but it's really just evening sunflowers or an if more of a fantasy evening garden um, for myself than anything. Um, so then the next wall, uh, the evening, this is cloudy night moon. Um, so I was just looking out the window. I woke up when I looked out the window and saw like this beautiful moon and all these, the clouds and the colors. Um, that's the same shed that's in the other painting. Um, early autumn sky. Um, and the big barn is actually, that was part of the farm, but now is my neighbor's house. They took a empty barn about, I guess, 30 years ago and renovated the whole thing themselves into a house. And this, I just wanted to accentuate the colors and the little windows you'd see behind there. And um, I was, you know, I used some of the pearlescent golden paints um, to get some which can be difficult to photograph and sometimes can get a little like flat, but I do love uh, using the golden paints, their interference colors and their um, pearlescent colors. Um, so yeah, that's that's from that. I And I had a series of photos of this one that I was thinking of doing some more, but sometimes that thought passes quickly or I get past that into something else. Um, and the next one is um, the path between the smokehouse and black walnut tree. There's this old building on our um, property. The, the black walnut tree is my neighbor's tree. And on the left side that you can't see is a spring house that we still get water from. And then on the right side is the smokehouse, which goes back to about 1756. And it's still in very good shape. My husband puts lights in it uh, to light it up. Um, and I, I I just loved how the path to it going up to the tree, the vertical to the tree, the rocks kind of gathered in the middle and the wall, that part of the wall has been coming down um, with so much flooding recent, you know, from Ida and recently the wall that has been there for so long um, has started to lose. Um, and my neighbor right now is starting to try to fix it. His family actually owned this farm for like a hundred years when we moved here, his father lived next door in another um, farmhouse and he could tell us everything about this area and about the farm. So uh, I liked, I, what I was thinking here too is, I mean, there's the car that's, you know, this era 
and the smokehouse. And sometimes I liked how this tree, the smokehouse, these things have been here so much longer than anyone around here. This area has been very um, well, completely developed all around. We watched it when we moved here, um, just explode with like a lot of, you know, McMansions and uh, houses everywhere. And on one farm, they're talking about warehouses now too. So it's it's interesting sometimes to see all of the different things that come into play with um, development like that. But, um, I, you know, that, so, and then the next painting is the same tree that was in the beginning of the uh, show. Um, I called this one Rest. It's a shagbark hickory tree in the back of our house. And there's a hammock underneath it. I painted this. I had COVID at the end of December last year, and I was so happy just to get back in the studio. And I felt like the colors were just um, coming out and kind of a feeling of, you know, when you're not feeling well or you're trying falling asleep and you just start you fall into a dream, I think, is the feeling I wanted from this one. Um, and yeah, so I use the hammocks a lot, I think, as a, another color in the landscape. And this is Scattering Light, which I ended up at, this is probably the last painting I painted before that I put into the show um, and was thinking in terms of, started looking you know, because this evening there were so many changes into the sky um, that I got more interested in how does the light change? How do these colors just explode in the background? And um, and it was such, a, there's a place at Marsh Creek where people actually pull into a circle each evening and watch um, the sunset change and everything. And that evening there was, there was even a woman just down near further down that started dancing in front of this one. And I got a whole series of photographs of it and all. Um, so, I mean, I love color. So these, I think the landscape and trying to, I, I guess the abstract expressionist too, of getting color, which I, I wouldn't say I'm an expressionist, I'm more of a color field painter. But And then and um, this one, I've painted this tree in the lake at Marsh Creek, like this is the third time. And this one I called Entwined. And I loved the, um, I guess the shape that it made in the middle, almost like a narthex. Um, and I called it Entwined. I was thinking of two people who have been together, you know, for years and their lives are entwined. They're, it's an embrace, um, you know, so that's, I, I think more or less what, uh, and then I liked the, like I said, the abstract pattern that those trees, um, the tree created in the water. Um, so, so Mary, in your artist statement, you make reference to scattering light. Yeah, yeah, and I found like a, I guess an explanation that you might say on a children's <laughs> site um, was that the sun is located near the horizon of the earth and light has to travel longer through the earth's atmosphere. And when white sunlight falls on atmospheric particles, blue light scatters out to space while red light scatters less. So I guess that's the process where you see the blue and the white changing into the red. And um, so I, I, I really do, I'm really drawn to that. I can't pay fast enough to um, capture it. At times I've come, started it, but I, I usually always finish them in the studio unless I do a little one. And I have done some works on paper and things like that. Um, this is um, the gray swan and it's acrylic on aluminum panel. And it's um, from Lily Lake in Cape May Point. I mean, there were two white swans with a gray swan between them resting in, on this little island in the the gray swan was wide awake and like it was sleeping between two parents who were, you know, that the gray swan was making them tired or something. Um, so I started looking up because the gray swan was very big and I was like, are, are there just full grown gray swans in there? Um, what I found, I, I fell into this rabbit hole of the, what of a gray swan events where a gray swan event in, um, I guess, 
in planning for IT or for politics or finance, I think it's used in finance more so, is something you can plan ahead for, like a, a disaster that could be predicted that you can plan for, um, like they use COVID and a recession, I think. Um, so when I felt, if started looking at that, I wanted to paint this more, but it was um, just, uh, that's, it's an acrylic on aluminum panel and it um, was just one of those things that uh, I just really wanted to paint. Um, the last two are related. They're both from the same walking path that I walk on. Um, the one on the left is very hopeful. That's um, New Year's Day and the one on the right very melancholy. That's night picnic. New Year's Day, I, I guess when I'm walking on this path, I feel like the trees kind of rise up when you're walking down and you, you feel, and it was from thing, photographs I took on New Year's Day, but I also went back to draw a little just to get the idea. Um, but just the feeling that on New Year's Day, you know, everything is new again. You have a chance to start over, um, you know, just hopeful, I think. Um, night picnic, on the same walk is um, it was a very melancholy painting for me. It was a place, um, the picnic tables were where um, my brother Ted was disabled and um, he lived in a nursing home um, probably the last few years because of, <clears throat> excuse me, multiple health problems. So we used to go on nice days to the picnic tables and um, we would, you know, I'd, we'd get lunch because I could pull a wheelchair up to them. Um, so one night when I was, Ted passed away in June um, 2020 during COVID. Um, so one night when I was walking, um, I, you know, was just thinking there was no one really else on the trail and it, just thinking about him and thinking how I have lost a lot of people in my life or family and, um, yeah, so it was a very melancholy painting, and later I wanted to add these imaginary birds, I think, to cut the melancholy, and it's sort of like, yeah, life is still going on, and my brother also, he loved animals. He was, I, I almost wanted to put more animals in, but I thought that would be a, too much of an illustration, so it was more of a feeling, a melancholy feeling for me um, than anything, so... Um, so that's, that's my, sh that's, I think everything. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. It's a beautiful show. Thank you. And next we come to Ian Wagner. Hello, Ian. Hi, Mike. Hi, everybody. Um, a little bit of a background is I spent a lot of years studying at Bathurst, so I have a lot of traditional training. And ironically enough, after doing a certificate and uh, BFA and MFA, I've spent a lot of time post PAFA trying to unlearn a lot of what I was taught just to cut myself some slack and make the work that I really want to make. But um, I'm not going to touch too much on the content of the work. Um, it's really open to interpretation and they're essentially figurative inkblot tests, but, um, they're an evolution of work I've been making for the last three years about, um, I have fallen in love with this brand of paper called, uh, Shizen, S-H-I-Z-E-N. It's very rough uh heavy duty watercolor paper and it's got the unfortunately you don't get to see the beautiful deckled edge because of the way they're framed but the roughness of the paper just allows me to just go for it there's no hesitation there's just to kind of steal michael moore's uh mode of operation i just start with lines and see what i get and it sounds quite funny, but the roughness of the paper gives me a little bit more control over the brush. So I'm able to get some finer lines and a little bit more delicate movement than I would on say a hot press watercolor paper. 
and just because it's so heavy, it it holds the Sumi ink that I use and gives us this rich, dark pulls that you don't really get on smooth paper or with India ink. And one of the things I've been wanting to try for a while now, and I've got around to do it for this group of work, is adding stamps to the process, which you can see a little bit on this figure's legs. Um, very long time ago, I did a large 40 inch piece using a single one inch stamp using multiple colors. And I've always enjoyed the process of just doing that. It didn't, didn't have to look like anything. It didn't have to mean anything, but just the process of making it. And I wanted to bring that into the more figurative illustrative work that I have been doing. Um, and it really helps break up some of the white space because sometimes it, it's good to have a balance, at least I feel that way, and not overwork the paper, to leave a little bit of the paper showing, but sometimes having that stark white isn't really suitable for the overall composition. So bringing in the stamps kind of helped me tone it down without it just being a boring, boring flat gray or muddy color and add a little bit of a little bit of a, a gift for people that are able to look at it in person look a little bit closer. Um, so Ian, the are you inventing these figures and scenarios or the, uh, what's the reference for them? Because it seems uh, like they're strung together in a narrative, but it's it's <laughs> not quite, you know, it's not super clear. That, that's giving me a little bit too much credit for thinking ahead. <laughs> um, there really was no planning. All, all the figures that do manifest in the work are in, entirely pulled out of my head. There's there's no reference. There's no models. There's there's none of that. Um, that that's part of the unlearning my traditional training a little bit. But I, I think the narrative element really comes through because I spend a lot more time watching movies and reading books than I do looking at other artwork and I've always been interested in illustration. I have made books in the past and a few of those books were made using work that really wasn't meant to go together. So I, I don't know if it's good or bad that my work tends to be thematically similar enough that one could put them all together into one book, but it, it is, there is a thread that seems to run through the work no matter how I make it or when it's been made. Well, and your titles are very specific. <laughs> Like, you know, it, the the titles are always the last thing I do, and and um, at the opening, Keith was kind of kidding around with me. He could hear my my voice in his head when he was typing the sheet, reading the titles to him. But I try to bring a little bit of comedy into the titles, just because some of the pieces can tend to be a little too serious. So the one of the previous pieces we just looked at with the girl with the glasses, I think that one is subtitled Get Off Your High Horse. It's just a little wink and a nod so things don't get too serious. And I think that comes from the fact that when I take my work much too serious, uh, I lose the flowing lines and y you don't get the flow or the openness that you can get using ink in this way. Funnily enough, this was the hardest set of work I've had the title in a very long time. It, it was very difficult to come up with titles for this batch. And I don't know if it's, I don't know if I just couldn't relate a title or pigeonhole them in a way, but it, it was kind of strange. Normally it, it doesn't take 
a week and a half to come up with titles. It took quite a bit this time. Been trying to add a little bit of color to these too. Um, they're all very muted. Is unfortunately my brain doesn't think in color as much as I would like it to, even with all the the traditional still life painting I've had. But um, just the black and white gets a little overbearing. And it's just nice to add a little bit of a touch just to break it up a little bit. And one of the things I did try to do consciously with this batch of drawings is make the abstract patterns work a little bit more. And I, I think that's why I really enjoyed making these this time around is yes, they're very, I mean, the figure it is front and center, but a lot of them do revolve around just basic shapes. And I, I think that was actually really satisfying when I was making these pieces. And that is one of the muses from last year. <laughs> she kind of kickstart started the uh, the muted colors, and just letting the line do the work. Thank you, Ian. Thanks. And now we have Susan D'Alessio. Hello, Susan. Oh, you're uh, muted. Yeah, hi. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I don't know that I'm going to talk about individual pieces so much. Um, I'm going through a um, transition in my artwork right now in uh, that I moved out of a, a good sized studio in East Falls that was about 15 by 25 feet and um, gave me an opportunity to really work with large work that I'd always wanted to do. Um, by large, I mean anything over than other than 12 by 12 or 18 by 18. And these are smaller pieces from, from a, a couple of years ago and the pieces that I have um, uncovered. I, I moved out of my studio in February and it was, it was an ordeal. Um, I had to sell all my studio furniture. And um, so I'm now in the, in the room that I'm in now, which is about nine by 12, as opposed to 15 by 25. So I got a, a rid of a lot of equipment and shelving and easels and desks and bookcases and all that. So um, it's it's been a transition, but it's been exciting in many ways, kind of a, a freeing. And um, so I'm, I'm feeling good about, about my future work, but right now I'm taking some time off. Um, I really haven't worked in two or three months and that's okay i um i'm doing things like getting some reading done and studying spanish mm -hmm. and uh getting more involved with being a creative cook so I, i'm truthfully not totally sure what's going on with me but i think i'm just gonna let things flow <laughs> until i know <laughs> I bought a cartoon from Andrea Beiser a couple of years ago. She's one of the other artists in the collective. And it's an Alice cartoon. And um, there's two figures. Alice is walk, about to walk out the door. And the man that's on the other side of the, of the view is um, saying, where are you going? And she turns around and she says, I don't know. I'll let you know when I get there. And, and I like that a lot. I think that's kind of been my motto for, for, for a while. Also, with my artwork, I like to plunge into things and not really have any idea where I'm going. 
that's an older piece that I had kind of hidden away when I took it off, when I took it out to um, to start getting things ready to move out of my studio. I thought, I always thought it was really ugly and I still kind of think it's ugly, but I really like it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm keeping it. <laughs> it's partly some fabric in there, which I had been doing um, a lot of up until um, a year or so ago. I've really burned my bridges. I've gotten rid of all the fabric that I was working with for the collages. I gave it away to a uh, an organization that was in my studio building called Fresh Artists, and it's for children and teachers. And um, it, uh, it went to a good place. And you attended the academy, yes, Susan? Yeah, right. I, I've been painting since uh, 2006 when I entered the academy. Yeah, I'd been a, a jeweler for 40 years and um, one day I just woke up and decided I didn't want to make any more jewelry. So that was another major transition for me, getting selling all my studio supplies, all my studio equipment. And, uh, but I knew that that's, I knew it was finished. I'd done everything I wanted to do with, with the medium. So yeah, I got a certificate, um, I graduated the same time that Ian did from the academy. And um, it was six years of just incredible, um, it was a blissful time, that's all I can say. It was six years of just being totally immersed in art and feeling like uh, I didn't have a lot of this distractions that a lot of the younger students had, you know, I was really took advantage of all the classes and all the free lectures and all the visiting artists and every time one of my teachers recommended an artist I'd go run up to the library and get a book about them. These are uh, recent pieces that I did during the pandemic in the room where I am now because I had trouble getting to my studio. It was about an hour commute to my studio and um, on the bus and during COVID it was just too scary to be getting on subways and buses at that time so I just didn't go very much. And these are found objects from my sidewalks in the area. My husband and I took a walk every morning during the COVID, about a mile walk, and I picked up these great leaf silhouettes that I, I couldn't pass up. I try not to pick up everything I see that I'm interested in on the sidewalks, otherwise our house would be really trashy. <laughs> These are still some of the fabrics that I had that uh, I inherited from a friend who had been a quilt maker all her life and never threw any of her fabric away. And so she kept it all. And she, after she died, her husband just really wanted to get it out of the house. So I took it all. I didn't really realize until I've been working with it for a while that because she was a quilt maker, maker all of the, um, Fabrics were usually very small prints, little tiny detailed uh, designs of flowers or stripes or plaids that quilt makers tend to use rather than anything that's too big and bold. I started working abstractly. It's something I always wanted to do and I didn't really know how to go about it. And I took a couple classes in abstraction and didn't really feel like I was going anywhere. So at the academy, like Ian mentioned, we you know, we were had a lot of specific classes like still life and and uh, perspective, and took some landscape painting, a lot of figure drawing. And um, why am I going? Where am I going with this? I can't remember. But anyway, um, oh yeah, I had a, a crit with uh, Stuart Chills. And um, I showed him some postcards that I've been making or, or, or uh, cards that I've been making for friends for birthday cards and they were they were collages. And uh, I showed them to him and he said, you really need to start taking this seriously. It's just not this throwaway thing you're doing. So, so I did start taking it more seriously and it developed into really my, my passion for collage was a real entryway into doing what I wanted to do, which is to work completely abstractly. This is somewhat not abstract. It's, it's, uh, I have a corn, a corn shock in here. 
this um, the white piece is my grandmother's tablecloth that I have been carrying around from place to place for the last how many years. And finally, I thought, what am I doing? No one's going to want this. So I started cutting it up and being, making it into a collage. So this is probably about the third uh, diptych that I've done um, using the two canvases so that I could um, take them apart and get them in a a car that we that we we don't have our own car so we rent SUVs and this that they fit perfectly in the back of a of a car when they're separated and it was fun to be able to work so large. I think the basis of this was a lithograph, I believe. I'm not even sure what it was. It might be. There's an impression on the uh, on the uh, paper, so it possibly was a remnant from a, a etching project that I've done. Thanks so much, Susan. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. You, you and Tina, Tina and Michael do such a fabulous job of hanging these shows. I'm just constantly in awe. Every time I come, I deliver the work, come back, and then see it just put together in a way that I would never have been able to do myself. It's just that I'm just, my breath is taken away. It's a magical. Process. It is magical. I know it is <laughs> <laughs> They're elves. There's night <laughs> well thank you again susan thank you to all the artists yeah. oh. and uh the show again is up through june 4th we hope you can come down and make it and thanks to everybody for coming and hope you have a great night thank you <laughs> <laughs>